Right, you're on, Shingan. I will go ahead. We can't hear you. Oh, we cannot hear you. Okay, I'll I'll come back to this. Come, Ramzan, we can't hear you. No, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I'm, I'm coming in. You? May I begin, sir? Yeah, go ahead, Singhanya. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to this evening's Colors of Glory virtual meet. I am Jia Simhanjana, one of the coordinators of this event. This is one in a series of fortnightly virtual meets we have been hosting ever since the pandemic set in year before last. While the regular attendees of our events do not need to be told what our organization is about, kindly bear with me through a brief introduction for the sake of our new attendees, whom we are delighted to welcome. Traditionally, our country never lacked organizations celebrating our heritage in almost every sphere of human activity, be it art, literature, or politics. However, for whatever reasons, the Indian Armed Forces do not en really enjoy this privilege. It is this grave anomaly that our founders set out to rectify by raising Colors of Glory Foundation, the first of its kind in India five years ago. Today, we are proud to assert that we have carved a niche for ourselves, celebrating the heroism of our men and women in arms, past and present, through innumerable events, outdoor and indoor, varying from battle reenactments and commemorative ma marathons to documentary shows and intercollegiate military history quizzes. Our website features... Program I kindly request our participants, please go on mute. Thank you. Our website features over 120 <coughs> popular blogs. We have a pan-Indian membership base of both armed forces veterans and civilian gentry, and some overseas members as well. We are confident of scaling loftier heights once we see the last of COVID-19. Meanwhile, we invite all of you who are not yet members of our organization to join us in our unique mission. Please visit our website to know how to join. I am delighted to give you a glimpse of the road we have traveled so far through this brief presentation. Vignesh, please mute everybody. Audio is not playing, Smell. Audio. Just a moment, sir. I'm sorry. I have switched on. Yeah, the, both the boxes are under me. Video and. Uh, 
thank you i now invite captain dp ramachandran to um, introduce our speaker for the day sir please thank you singanjana good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, i'm delighted and honored to introduce our distinguished speaker for this evening who unlike the military men we normally bring in is an outstanding academician who has ventured uh, to the realm of military history and created a stunningly superb book on our non-combatant soldiers of World War I. Formerly the Professor of Modern Indian History at Dawlalar University, Dr. Radhi Yosinga, who holds a PhD from Cambridge University, has been focusing her research interests in the social history of crime and criminal law. Identification practices, governmentality, borders, and border closing. Apart from a recent book on the involvement of Indian labor in the First World War, the Cooley's Great War, which has drawn us to her writing. She has published another book, A Despotism of Law, Crime and Justice in Early Colonial India. Before I hand over the screen to her, let me add a few words about the book, The Cooley's Great War. It so happened that early last year, I just finished reading another outstanding book on uh, the First World War on our uh, combat soldiers. Uh, that is the Indian Empire at War by George Morton Jack. Now, when I write up on this book appeared in the Hindu, and I immediately ordered a copy, it was doubly stimulating because, uh, you know, I've just read all those soldiers fighting in various theaters. Immediately after that, what our non combatants were doing, it was quite an eye opener because. Uh, See, it, it's so fascinating account of the tremendous contribution of our humble laborers, right after reading the uh, of our combatants. I realized how little we know about uh, this less glamorous phase of war. Of course, in South India, many of us in our younger days would have heard of the disparaging terms, Ulipatol, being used for laborers uh, who enlisted, for that matter, even for combatants, because uh, there certainly was a stigma of. Uh, uh, them being considered mercenaries, even the combatants. Let me doing some uh, research on the Naga insurgency. I learned that its genesis uh, was with the with some Naga laborers going to France during First World War. But only after reading this book, I realized what a massive enterprise uh, the Indian labor code was. The British had even classified our tribal people as primitives. I mean. Uh, <laughs> Believe me, the research which has gone into creation of this book is incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, there's an old story out there in this book. In fact, uh, Professor Singer asked me which part of the book I would like her to speak about. I chose the Mesopotamian campaign because that is where the maximum number of our laborers were engaged. So you will have a, a, a brand new story here rather than old military stories you keep hearing always. Uh, now, without further ado, I'll, uh, I, I invite Professor Singer to address the gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Ramachandran, for that very generous uh, introduction. Um, and also Simhanjana for handling the technological aspects of the talk. It's a real pleasure and a privilege to uh, be here. Throughout my work on uh, this book, I have been in touch with the United Services Institution India and at Delhi, and with people who are interested in military uh, history, who were from the armed forces. And what I have always found is that there is an openness to different kinds of history, and that disagreement is tolerated, which is what we should be striving to maintain. Uh, but I also found that apart from a few trolls, there was quite a lot of interest uh, in the history of non-combatants. And that I think is because uh, the value of work is now more appreciated in India than it was at that time. And yet uh, during that period itself, in the course of the war, we can see that labor is emerging as a political category. I might point out that in the emergence of labor as a political category, which people had to take account of, Madras presidency played a very important role 
one of the first major unions, as you know, was formed in Madras in 1918. So now to get back to my story, Professor mm -hmm. Ramachandran asked me to speak on uh, the Indian, uh, uh, the British occupation of Ottoman Iraq, which they called Mesopotamia. Now, Iraq was made up of three uh, provinces of Basra, Baghdad, and Mosul. And next to Basra was the, uh, in Persia, Persia was, was on this, we'll look at a map just now, but next to, um, next to Basra was Abadan, where you had the oil works of the Anglo-Persian oil company. But I'm running ahead of my story, so I'll begin to screen share now. Um, Simanjana, is it showing? Not yet, ma'am. Uh, not yet? No? Just a minute. <laughs> Just a minute. <laughs> Vignesh, are you there? Just one So Manchina, is it showing now? No? Yes, uh, it just has to, you have to uh, put it on the presentation mode. So this presentation. Uh, okay. It's on the yeah, right I, bottom. Yeah, you told me about that, yeah. Is, is that okay now? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so uh, I believe I have about 40 minutes for my talk. Is that, does that still hold or should I cut, uh, cut it short now, given the no, time? No, 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 okay, all right. right. No, no need to cut short. So I've called my talk making from the chapter in my book called Making the Desert Bloom, Indian Labor in British Occupied Iraq. Now, uh, as Professor Ramachandran pointed out, what is not known is that of the 1.4 million men whom India contributed to uh, empire in World War I, over half a million were in fact non-combatants. Now, if we focus on labor, that is if we focus on, and now these non-combatants offered a dizzying variety of different kinds of services. And a focus on, sites of labor actually allows us to understand why India could contribute 1.4 million. It also allows us to understand why it did not contribute more than 1.4 million. Because the British, uh, uh, you know, in Britain, the complaint constantly was that India had a population of 320 million. So why did it contribute only this infinit infinitesimal? number. So one argument which the government of India said was that, you know, in India, not every person is uh, sort of eugenically qualified to be a soldier. We can recruit only from the martial tribes. But the question then arose, what about labor? India was known to be a pool of labor for empire. So why did it not contribute more labor to the war? Now, a focus on non-combatants also gives us a more complex sense of the impact of the war upon India. Otherwise, sometimes some accounts tend to be very Punjab-centered. Of course, Punjab was extremely important. But I found, for example, 
that by July 1918, when uh, by spring summer 1918, when Punjab had been gutted, uh, had been uh, drained dry, you know, UP started to come into the picture and to outstrip Punjab, both in providing combatants and non-combatants. So we need to build up a more textured picture of the spatial and social impact of the war upon India. Now, one reason why uh, Britain did not kind of take, it took to subtle forms of coercing labor, but it did not resort to open conscription because it did not want to panic labor at other sites. In other words, the Indian Army's demand for Indian labor had to compete with the need for labor at other sites, and this labor could not be panicked. So you needed labor for the generation of war material. Madras presidency, for example, was providing textiles, army clothing, cinchona for, uh, you know, for malaria treatment in uh, East Africa and Mesopotamia. Its forests were supplying products. Its hide and skin industries were meeting the demand for military boots. Now these, uh, not only was this important directly to generate war material, but this labor was also very important to produce those export surpluses, which allowed Britain to make up for the trade deficits, which she was building up, particularly with America. And equally important, Indian labor uh, was positioned uh, at, the, at various transport and communication infrastructures, which were absolutely crucial to the war effort. And it was very important to ensure that they kept to these sites, that is on railways, ports, and merchant ships. For example, Indian Laskars made up 17.5% of the labor on British merchant ships just before World War I. And when British sailors were taken into the Navy, uh, the number of Indian Laskars on British merchant shipping, in fact, went up. Now let's look at how we must reframe the way that India sort of contributed to the war, but the war also came into India. Now, when I went through the administrative reports for Madras presidency, I would keep coming across this phase. The war attracts but little interest. And again, at the time when the, uh, the treaty, a peace, uh, when the armistice was signed in November 1918, the administration for rep a report for Madras said that due to high prices and influenza, this was would be remembered not as a time where peace had been declared, but it would be remembered as a time of poverty and misery. It was difficult, the report said, to bring home to the masses the fact of the victorious termination of hostilities. Now, to give you a sense of how, of the kind of different frames in which we ought to look at World War I, and I say this because a lot of interest in India, even at that time, focused on Indian troops in France and Belgium, because this was the first time that they had been allowed to fight a European enemy on European territory. But in fact, you know, we have to sort of get a really more global, uh, we have to strive towards a more global picture of World War I. And one of those areas we have to look at is the Indian Ocean. Now, we can see that Madras presidency, which of course stretched from the south, uh, from the eastern coast at that time to the western coast, we have to look at the way the Madras presidency looks out across the Bay of Bengal towards uh, Ceylon and on the other side to Burma, the Straits and Malaya. And if we go down across uh, to the China seas, uh, I draw your attention to uh, the uh, to the to a base here uh, in Tsingtao, Qingdao, in Shantung province. We'll come to that just now. On the other side, I invite you to look at the way in which from Bombay or Karachi, Basra here, uh, 
was very, very close, as we can see. So from, from the point of view of the Indian government, it, you know, and they said that, Hardin said, you know, Basra is, you know, close enough for us to, in fact, absorb Basra into the empire of India, if that's possible. Now, let's go down to uh, the way in which Madras looks out towards the Bay of Bengal. Now, when we are talking about the contribution of Indian labor to the war, we can't only look at labor within the boundaries of India. We also have to look at that labor, which, for example, from the impoverished agricultural tracts of Madras presidency, as well as from the coastal areas of Cochin and Malabar, was circulating around the Burma, the Straits, Malaya, and Ceylon. This labor was positioned on tea, coffee, and rubber plantations. It was positioned at tin mines and oil. Now, I'm sure all you military historians know, will sort of are well aware of how important these commodities are for the conduct of war. And we're reminded again, of course, about that because Russia's pipelines, of course, you know, for oil go through Ukraine. Now, what is interesting is that in, in 1916 to 17, there was a massive campaign against the sending of Indian laborers under indentured contract to the sugar plantations empire, uh, which by that time, uh, Indian labor was going to Fiji in the Pacific on the one side, and on the other side, it was still going to some, um, uh, some col uh, British colonies in the West Indies, namely it was going in particular to Trinidad and British Guyana. Now the campaign against indentured migration was, for example, very strong in the Madras presidency. But by now, indentured migration to Fiji and the West Indies had become a narrow trickle. It was the circulation of labor around it, of labor include, and very substantially Tamil labor around the Bay of Bengal, which we have to keep our eye on. And at this very time, for example, we noticed that the Madras administration report said that in fact, there's an increase in Madras presidency labor migration to Malaya. So these, this, it, when we look at India's labor contribution, we also have to look at Tamil labor positioned at all these sites around the Bay of Bengal. In addition, you had Tamil labor working on the docks of Colombo and Rangoon. Here's a picture of dock coolies, probably from the coast of Malabar and Cochin. They were known as coast coolies, loading tea at Ceylon. Here you have a picture of an Australian troop ship at Colombo in 1915, and you can see the laborers there who are helping to load on coal and supplies. This is the HMS. Now let's look uh, at how, now when I'm saying that, you know, when the British said that Madras was not really interested in the war, of course, I'm leaving out uh, the fact that right at the beginning of the war on 20 September, 22nd September, 1914, a British light cruiser sailed into the harbor of Madras, guided by the light of the Madras High Court, which whose dome also functioned as a lighthouse, I think, for Madras. Captain Ramachandran will correct me if I'm wrong. It came in and it bombed, uh, it shelled Madras, and two of the storage uh, oil tanks of the Burma Shell Oil Company, which had been built on the beach uh, in front of the Madras High Court, uh, caught fire. And in fact, this uh, light cruiser, the SMS Emden, made a remarkable series of raids to try and sort of disrupt uh, merchant shipping around the Bay of Bengal. Of course, uh, this, uh, and in the process of looking up the story, I realized, as I told Professor Ramachandran, what a deep interest the people of Chennai take, citizens of Chennai take in the history of the city, because I found so many wonderful articles on this particular episode and the way in which Emden, uh, the word for somebody who's rough and bullying, entered both the Tamil language as well as Balayara. Okay, now this reminds us of one very important legacy of World War I, 
that is World War I witnessed the transition from the use of wood and steam power to the use of coal and oil. Um, that's why you had these Burma shell storage tanks, you know, on the Madras beach. Now, we mustn't over kind of state how important oil was in 1914. It was important. The British Navy had shifted from uh, coal powered engines to oil. And Britain had bought a 51% stake in the Anglo-Persian oil company at Abadan in Persia. That is, uh, sorry, I've written wrongly here, Iraq, Persia, that is Iran. So that's a mistake. Now in 1914, uh, before the war broke out in Abadan, you had already about a thousand Indian artisans and laborers working on the oil installations. And some of them had in fact come from the Burma Shell's oil works uh, at Rangoon and in Burma. So what you can see is that all around the Indian Ocean, what you had was a circulation, both of Indian artisans and of laborers. And we can see the presence of Madras presidency in this flow. Now, by the end of the war, as we know, oil imperialism was now on the world stage. Now, what we have to remember is that uh, we must think of the British Empire as sort of uh, operated from various centers, not just from London. And in a sense, India was a very important sub-imperial center for the British Empire. It's from India that you had the expansion of the British Empire outwards across the land and sea frontiers of India. And constantly there was a running battle for spheres of influence and legitimacy between the government of India and the Ottoman Sultan in his Arabian speaking territories. That is in Egypt, which the British, which had come under British rule in 1885, in Arabia, Saudi Arabia, which would be taken over uh, where the British would support an Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire during the war, that is in 1916, and further up into the territory from Syria onwards to uh, Iraq, uh, and as I said, to the three, uh, to the, uh, and next to Iraq, we have the, you don't see it on this map, but very close to Basra on the other side in Iran, we have Abadan. Now this was familiar to people in India. They were familiar with the sending of Indian troops to Aden, Persia, up, uh, Aden, Iran, Bashar, up the Persian Gulf. But what happened in World War I was a massive outflow of both combatants and non-combatants into the Persian Gulf. So World War I witnessed, in fact, the first major flow of Indian labor into the Persian Gulf. Now, expeditionary in uh, November, between November 1st and November 20th, Indian Expeditionary Force sailed into the Persian Gulf to signal to the Persian Gulf chiefs that Britain was in command of the Persian Gulf to protect the Anglo-Persian oil company at Abadan, Iran, and to occupy Basra in Ottoman, uh, to occupy Basra in Iraq, to prevent Germany's entry into the Persian Gulf. But declaring war against the Ottoman emperor was something which had to be managed very carefully in terms of public opinion in India, because what we must remember is that there was a huge percentage of Muslims in the Indian army and Britain in order to expand her sphere of influence in Central Asia, in Afghanistan and in the Arabian territories of the Ottoman Empire had very often cast herself as the largest Mohammedan power in the world. It often pointed out that there were more Muslims within the British empire than in any other empire. Here's a kind of map which tried to capture this. You can see that this Goliath over there at the bottom represents Mohammedans 
in the British Empire. I'm sorry, I don't want to use the impolite word Mohammedans, but it's written over there. So the Goliath over there shows Muslims in the British Empire. That kind of much smaller figure there shows Muslims in the Turkish Empire. So that's, you know, you can get a sense of the kind of propaganda message they were going to get across. And they assured Muslims in India and elsewhere that the holy sites of Islam would be preserved, there would be no attack on them, and they would be sort of safe for Muslim ecumeny. Now, uh, at first, things went very well, and these victories in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Mesopotamia were very important for the British Empire because casualty rates in France were terrifying. And in Gallipoli, that is in the Dardanelles, uh, the uh, Entente forces were, the Turkish forces were putting up a very, very stiff resistance and things were not going well. And uh, so there was a pressure for the Indian army to make a rush up to Baghdad, even if it was, infra even though it was overextended and it did not have the sort of logistical capacity to do so. So what you had then was early victories were followed by reverses from November, in particular, a very massive uh, defeat at Setisfon, which led to the retreat of the 6th Division of the Indian Army to a little Arab town called Kut ul Amara, where they held out a siege for 145 days before surrendering on 29th April 1916 to the Turkish forces and to Germany, and I've given you a photograph of the condition of some of the Indian soldiers who in fact managed to survive it after this 145 day siege of Kut. Yes, okay. Now what you have is that as a result of these reverses, the government of India came under heavy criticism for not having done enough to support the British empire. It was as a result of this criticism that in 1917, Britain was, uh, India was forced to declare that she would subscribe 100 million pounds as a free gift for England's uh, war expenses. That is in addition to the money she was already spending on troops, etc. cetera. And uh, as a result of that, you had the first Indian war loan in 1917. So one of the ways that the war filtered into places which were not directly connected to the war, for example, war, uh, Madras presidency in some ways, was that people began to be asked to subscribe to the war loan, either through bigger bonds or through the post office savings certificate of seven and a half rupees, which became a part of middle class people's strategies uh, for saving more permanently. And it was also as a result of this war loan and the pressure on silver supply that you had Indians introduced for the first time between December 1917 and January 1918 to small denomination currency notes, that is rupees one and rupees two and a half notes. Now I'm saying, I'll just invite your attention to this cartoon. You can see that the lions are rallying the cubs lion cubs are rallying around to the uh, lion, who's the British Empire. Everybody's carrying a bucket. And the bucket which India is carrying is labeled substandard assistance. So it's, it's a, the cartoon sort of shows you the kind of pressure which the government of India was now under to do more. And of course, what you needed for Mesopotamia was a huge labor supply. Now, Mesopotamia, that is Ottoman Iraq, was very backward in terms of transport. It didn't have, uh, you know, all weather roads. It didn't have a railway. Uh, its port facilities were very underdeveloped. So industrial warfare in conditions was where transport was primitive and where the Arab population was very low. Not only was the Arab population low, but if you put too much pressure on them to forcibly supply labor to the occupying British forces, then you know, your, uh, uh, they would react. And your propaganda was that you were rescuing Arabs from Ottoman misrule. Now, where was going, Britain going to get this labor? It got this labor from India and Egypt, 
Of course, it also recruited locally, that is from the Kurds, from, uh, from, from Persia, and from local Arab labor, often obtained through the assistance of Arab headmen and contractors. Now, it is at this point that a Madras Porter Corps, it was first known as a Porter Corps, then it became known as the first Madras Labor Corps. This was one of the first to reach Mesopotamia, along with two Punjab Labor Corps. It had actually been raised for Gallipoli. But by December, you know, the British uh, were retreating from Gallipoli. So this Madras Labor Corps, Porter Corps, was directed to Mesopotamia instead. What was the kind of work? Uh, which uh, these labor units from India and Egypt did. They had to do dock work because ships would come, but there would be no labor to unload them. They had to construct flood embankments. Remember that Mesopotamia, Basra area is all marshy ground. And Basra was now a huge military encampment which had to be protected from floods. And you had to have people to man and the inland water transport. In addition, of course, you had to have camp followers to look after the reproduction, everyday, everyday reproduction of the combatants. You had to have mule drivers who were non-combatants till 1917 for transport. You had to have medical personnel. You had to have sweepers, ward boys, uh, and uh, compounders in British military hospitals. So what? here are the figures then of the... Sorry, there's this thing which I can't see the top of my slide, but it shows you that of the some about the six uh, lakh combatants and non-combatants sent to Mesopotamia, not all at once, but over the course of the war, half were actually non-combatants. Now, there were serious problems about recruitment, which led to a bottleneck in labor supply in 1916. News had filtered into India about reverses in Mesopotamia. Uh, the British government couldn't use force because already there was a campaign against uh, the sending of indentured laborers to the West Indies and Fiji. So what they began with was by recruitment in jails and from criminal tribe settlements promising a remission in sentence of freedom from uh, freedom from police surveillance. Now, what we must remember is that we talk about COVID warriors today. Well, these were the people who were being sent without informing them. The sweepers and the dhobis, the laundrymen, they were being sent into the thick of an epidemic front in Basra because cholera had broken out in the military forces sent to Mesopotamia. In addition, the British government wanted to maintain a certain censorship over the sending of this huge supply of labor to Iraq because Arab, they didn't want the Arabs uh, to really know how many Indian laborers were being brought in, lest the Arabs see in this uh, future in which Basra was going to be absorbed into the empire of India. So they had to keep reassuring Arab notables there in Iraq that we are bringing in labor, but they're not going to be allowed to settle down in Iraq. But on the other hand, in India, people started to ask, Indian journalists started to ask, you know, what is there in this campaign for India? Will India be allowed to kind of participate in the kind of development which the British promised they were going to bring to, the, uh, to Iraq? Now, eventually, seven jail labor and porter corps were sent from India, uh, which made up about 16,000 men. In addition, there were miscellaneous jail recruitment, jail recruited units, such as about 1,100 sweepers. And from Madras, you also had a Madras jail, a jail gardener corps, which was sent. Because remember, Beri Beri had broken out. Mesopotamia doesn't have, you know, you know, you know to, to sort of grow vegetables and all for the troops, they sent in a gardener corps from Madras. Now, of course, it wasn't just jail recruitment. Ultimately, some 19 Indian labor corps and 12 Indian porter corps were sent to Mesopotamia from India. There were, of course, other labor units. Now, here what you see is a convict labor corps working on a very major flood embankment around Basra, which is the Shaiba Bund. 
Now, what is interesting is that unlike soldiers and enrolled followers, Indian labor was very insistent that they would serve only for limited contracts. They would not serve for the duration of the war. Uh, with such a formidable employer as the army, the Indian laborers uh, wanted to be sure that uh, at least there was a termination point. So for example, in the Madras presidency, when they went around trying to recruit labor for labor recruitment uh, training centers and labor railway labor companies, officials said, please don't use this term, period of war, because they said the very reference to the war leads to an apprehension that the men are to be sent into the firing line. The Indian laborers were not so naive. They knew why they wanted a limited contract. They wanted to be able to renegotiate their terms at the end of a fixed year. Here's the poster which I use for my book jacket, which is from a, a, war, a, a poster, a recruiting poster, which, invi which invited labor from Madras presidency to come to a railway training camp at Tirupatur. And here is a picture, which was very interesting for me. It almost looks as though it's an Indian laborer who is pulling this locomotive engine. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, the photograph gives the impression, but it is literally the case. You can literally see the laborer pulling the locomotive engine into Mesopotamia. Here's a picture of the Indian servants uh, crossing the Dala River in Mesopotamia. They were known, this was the, institutional name for them was the menial or attached followers, that is the sweepers, cooks, water carriers, the bishtis, the sices who cut grass, etc. for the regiments. Here's a picture of the 18th uh, labor, uh, Indian Labor Corps working on a road construction site in Mesopotamia. Now, labor uh, to kind of, uh, to in a sense, prevent criticism in India and to distance the sending of labor to Mesopotamia from the stigmatized system of indentured labor migration, the men who were recruited to the labor in Portaco were formally enrolled under the Indian Army Act. This included both day laborers as well as free laborers. Now, so far as the day labor is concerned, what you find is that is, it is an example of the way in which forms of forced labor were tapped by all the imperial powers to get labor for World War I. Uh, the lab, jail labor corps, it's a story of high degree of overuse, high degree of violence, therefore, inflicted on them, high rates of sickness, uh, the Madras government asked for a report about the 10th Madras Jail Labor Corps, hoping to publicize it as an experiment in penal reform. But they had to drop the idea because reports came in of a high level of sickness and a high level of flogging. In fact, for this labor, desertion was not so much to run away because they had been promised a remission of sentence. Desertion, in a sense, was the only way they could actually get a rest. Now, free labor units were less documented, and I have a feeling that the level of violence used on them was less. For example, I came across one line entries about the first Madras Porter Corps, which, whose name was then transformed to the Madras Labor Corps, because the work they were doing was not just dock work, it became very, very diverse. So we have a report from 1916 of them unloading supplies in blistering heat and under shelling. In October 1918, we have a planter from, I think, Kunur, Lieutenant Maynard Mansfield Wright, night who reports that his men of the first Madras Labor Corps had been cutting, their hands were bruised, cutting rock to extend the Khanikan Railway across to Persia. He reported that they had no boots at all and only one blanket each, and the temperatures were freezing. Now, no small wonder then that there was a high incidence of influenza among the men and Maynard Knight himself died. And these men who earned, you know, about 20, 20 rupees at the most, they paid by subscription because he was a kind commanding officer. They paid by subscription for a memorial to him at Swale, a plaque, a memorial plaque to him at Swale in Kent, UK. Of course, Nobody was putting up memorials for all the others. Uh, and I found a lot of Malabar names among, that means the coast 
I think the coast recruitment for Ceylon, et cetera, I mean, that was also being tapped for, uh, you know, possibly for Madras labor sent to Mesopotamia. Now, here's another picture that, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, the British did sometimes have to allow some amount of recreation even for the jail labor corps. And we hear that the Madras jail porter corps set up a dramatic society which performed plays in Tamil and Kannada. I don't know whether this is the first Madras labor corps. Some of the headgear suggests that they might be. But here's a performance of men dressing up as women and performing before a crowd of laborers. So uh, let me wind up now and say that just as, you know, India, we have to look at the way in which Madras presidency in 1914 was, you know, the war came home to Madras in the form of the shelling of uh, the Emden, but then, you know, the war seemed to recede from Madras. Now, the timeline of the war looks very different when we look at the timeline of World War I from either from, say, Persia or from India. And in a very real sense, we can say that so far as India was concerned, uh, you know, uh, Britain ended the war financially bankrupt, but with her territorial presence massively expanded in the Middle East. Now, with British soldiers pressing for demobilization, as also the Australian uh, and other Commonwealth soldiers, who was going to sort of, where were the boots on the ground going to come from? And the boots on the ground were going to come from India. So in Iraq, Indian non-combatants were still crucial to the railways and the Indian inland water transport. Now, uh, the Arabs in Iraq uh, sort of finding that the British seemed to be making the occupation of Iraq into a permanent feature. There was a massive Arab uprising in Iraq in 1920, which meant that 70,000 men had to be again rushed in from India to crush this uprising. Britain had maintained garrisons in Aden and Persia before the war. It was even more necessary for her to maintain these Indian army garrisons after the war. So in February 1921, you still had about 74,000 Indian military and uh, combatant and non-combatant personnel in Mesopotamia, as well as about 23,000 personnel in Egypt and Palestine. Now, the embarrassing thing for the government of India was that while these combatants and non-combatants were needed, Indian settlers, Indians were Indian traders, petty merchants, hawkers, etc., were not being allowed to settle down in British-occupied Iraq. New passport regulations made it very clear that uh, there would be immigration restrictions against Indians in Iraq. So it seemed that the situation which confronted Indians in East Africa and South Africa was being duplicated again in Mesopotamia. And here's a sort of a letter from uh, an ICS officer. The government of India was not happy about it. It protested about it. It said that Mesopotamia was conquered largely by the aid of Indian troops. We stripped India bare. We tore up miles of railway line. We denuded India of engines, rolling stock, engineering material, and even foodstuffs actually to the point of danger. But uh, the Indian government uh, was on the back foot. It really couldn't do very much about this. Now, in India, what you have at this time is the Rowlet, uh, uh, Satya, uh, Rowlet Satyagraha, which in a sense was an effort to bring the war to an end. Because basically, the Rowlet Acts tried to extend British wartime ordinances into peacetime. It was a major civil liberties movement in India and one which people in the streets participated in as much as Mahatma Gandhi and the Ali brothers. This was followed by the non-cooperation movement and one uh, of, the, of the features of the campaign was to ask for the withdrawal of Indian troops and laborers from Mesopotamia. What you had in Indian newspapers across a wide political spectrum was a very clear understanding that German militarism had been replaced by French and British militarism in the near and Middle East. Here is an extract from Tilak's paper, Maratha. Uh, 
the use of our soldiers to trample down freedom in the Near and Middle East brands us as a nation of mercenaries in the eyes of our Asiatic fellow brethren, as we have been already branded as a nation of coolies. Now, uh, Professor Ramachandran referred to, you know, Indian soldiers being referred to as mercenaries. I would say that for most of the war, actually, whether it was Gandhi or whether it was Lajpat Rai or Tilak, they accepted the fact that to ask for political concessions, India would have to participate in the war. But it is at this point, really, after the armistice, when Indian troops and laborers continued to be kept in Mesopotamia, without any discernible benefit for India, that the word mercenary now begins to circulate a bit more. And Khilafat leaders and Gandhi begin to invite Indian soldiers to think about the politics of their deployment. And what is interesting is that when we talk of Pan-Asia, we always tend to think of, you know, we tend to look from India towards Southeast Asia. We tend to look at, you know, the circuits of Buddhism and of uh, Hindu cultures uh, towards Southeast Asia. But at this moment, between 1919 to 21, across the political spectrum in India, uh, leaders were realizing that the quest for self-government in India had to be aligned with struggles for autonomy in Persia, Iraq, Egypt, and Afghanistan. Lajpat Rai also subscribed to the idea, uh, also supported the independence of what he termed Muslim West Asia for another reason. He said that if Indian troops could be taken into these territories to crush uh, the aspiration to autonomy, then people from those territories could be brought into India to cr crush Indian autonomies for, uh, to crush Indian aspirations for freedom. So for different reasons, even very conservative Indian politicians were very critical now of the Mesopotamian campaign because peace was followed by four deficit budgets for India because of all these military expenses. So I'll stop now th at this point and say, therefore, that to a very real extent, the presence of Indian troops in Mesopotamia, of Indian troops and non-combatants in Mesopotamia in the period 19 to 1921 was a part of the transnational dimension, both of the Rowlet Satyagraha as well as of the Khilafat movement in India. Okay, so that's it. I'll stop screen sharing now and we can have some discussion. Thank you very much uh, for a, a very absorbing talk, uh, Dr. Singha. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, floor is open for questions. Anyone, uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, shoot your questions, please. Can I ask? Yeah, please, sir. Uh, Madam, it was a very, very, very interesting topic. All I wanted to ask you was that uh, India was one of the colonies of the British. There were several colonies because the sun never set in the British Empire. Did they utilize the population of other countries to do such menial jobs like the labor corps was put to uh, use by the uh, army for their war effort? Uh, yes, all the colonial. Uh, should I answer uh, 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 as as the questions come up? Please Individually, so okay. Yes, okay. So, uh, Colonel Krishna Swami, yes, all the empires used colonial labor in World War One. Uh, France, perhaps, was one of the earliest to start using colonial labor from all its colonies. Uh, but in India, uh, actually, what is interesting is that uh, there was. Uh, yes. So, for example, as I pointed out, Egypt was in fact a British uh, in the British sphere of influence from 1885, and a huge amount of Egyptian labor was used, both in Palestine as well as in Mesopotamia. Egyptian labor was also used in France. In France, Britain, in after the Battle of the Somme, it was forced to think of drawing colonial labor even into the European theater of war. So in France, uh, Britain drew upon labor from Egypt, 
from South Africa, the South African lab native labor contingent. It drew upon labor from Fiji. Uh, and it, its West Indian, uh, rich, uh, West Indian combatants were basically used as non-combatants uh, in France. So yes, uh, they were drawing upon other colonies and all, and, and all uh, other colonies as well. And in fact, in France, it was more comfortable for them to use Indian non-combatants because in their minds, basically Indian laborers were just coming there for their food and money and they were doing it in India, they could do it in France. It was more uncomfortable for them to have Indian combatants in France than to have Indian non-combatants. And also the sight of Indian non-combatants in France doing reassuring things like making chapatis, cutting wood, uh, building roads and all was a reassuring sign that even if, you know, civilization seemed to be, war seemed to be kind of destroying civilization in Europe, somewhere out there in India and in Burma, empire was carrying on serenely. Thank you, ma'am. You also brought out a point to say that the Indian Army Act was uh, brought in uh, for the control of these labor force. What are the requirements for this Indian Army? Because after all, they were non-competents and they were all civilian labor. They are drawn from various places, even including the jails and all. Was it a sort of a fear to instill a sort of a fear for them? Or was to prevent uh, desertions? What are the reasons for that Indian Army Act to be brought? Stringent Army Act. And were there any were there any disciplinary cases what is dealt with? And if so, if so, what what are the uh, I mean punishment that they involved? I hope there were no killings and shootings because somebody general court martial was very prevalent in uh, those days. And also, were any privileges given? For example, if somebody did an outstanding job, did they recognize the thing being there and gave them some medals and all? This is a very interesting set of questions. Now, from 19, uh, the Indian Army Act was first kind of integrated and passed in 1911. And yes. one of the reasons for passing it was that already the Indian Army, both its combatant and non-combatant detachments, were being used not only under the control of the CNC in India, but also under the control of the War Office in England. For example, during the Boer War, they were not supposed to send Indian combatants to South Africa because it was supposed to be a, a white man's war, but very many Indian non-combatants had been sent uh, for the Boer War. So in 1911, many of the followers, uh, you know, uh, who were in the transport services, medical services, and as camp followers, that is regimental servants, those who were considered essential to the mobilization of a unit on field service, they were now formally enrolled. And they use this formal enrollment to improve their status. So for example, we find that followers now begin to be given uh, silver medals, service medals, along with combatants, even before World War I. But in World War, sorry, but in World War I, what you had was a situation in which you had to have, uh, you know, those people whom you did not consider a part of the army, like the so-called coolie corps, who were also being used everywhere. They were being used on the frontier. They had been used during the China expedition in 1902 to quell the Boxer uprising. Now these, they could not be called coolie, uh, coolie corps anymore. They had to be given a more politically correct name. So they were called the Labor and Porter Corps. And the reason for enrolling them as followers under the Indian Army Act was to, in fact, throw a military cloak over them. So they could be, it could be said that they were being sent for military service overseas. The term used was enrollment for military service underseas. So this also helped to kind of merge non-combatants into the figure of combatants. Now, so far as labor was concerned, this recruitment, this uh, enlistment under the Indian Army Act meant that if you wanted to flog them, you could now do so only by formally having a special court martial under the terms of the Indian Army Act. Now, very many of the people who had been sent in command positions of the Indian Labor Corps were people like jail officers, uh, planters, etc., were not uh, who found it somewhat below their dignity to have to have a formal 
at least, you know, special court martial is a one man court martial. And the outcome is always clear. But uh, that they had to go through this formality, they found it uh, somewhat below their dignity. So you do have, for France, for example, I couldn't, there were court martials, but I couldn't find the records. For Mesopotamia, interestingly, the records which I found uh, were basically the documentation for the J Labor Potter and Corps was more than the documentation for the Free Labor Corps. So I cannot say that the picture would be the same. My impression is that the same because the Jail Potter and Labor Corps were paid half. They were paid rupees 10. Whereas the uh, Free Labor Corps were paid rupees 20. Uh, and they were subject to much stricter discipline. So a lot of, a lot of a much greater level of violence had to be used to keep them in place. So that is a sorry tale of floggings. And as I said, of desertions, they would try to sort of desert and go travel via Persia back to India. Many of them died in the desert trying to do so. But at the same time, there was a recognition also uh, of their services. And uh, well, the recognition was very limited. For example, um, you know, any fines that they had were remitted, et cetera. Uh, there wasn't really very much that they got out of it. Uh, when we look at the Indian Labor Corps in France, we find that in France, where the sending of the Indian Labor to Corps to France is under the war office, the laborers come back with bronze medals, like other so-called colored labor in the Western theater. In Mesopotamia, the followers got the silver medal because the Indian army already before World War I had started distributing silver medals to its silver service medals to its enrolled follower ranks as well as to the combatant ranks. Uh, I hope that answers your question, uh, Krishna Swami. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go, go ahead. Uh, 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 yeah. Ma'am, this is Colonel Sundar. I don't have a question. I just want to thank you for the fascinating presentation. Because usually history is seen through the lens of the West and the beautiful photographs and everything that you had shown was really an eye opener. It showed us under what horrific conditions and also the contribution that India has made. Another very interesting uh, aspect that you brought out was how German militarism had been replaced by French and uh, British militarism. I'm really thankful for you as an educated man. I don't have a question. I just wanted to compliment you for this really fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. I have a question <laughs> myself, uh, Professor Singer. It's not, uh, um, you know, it's not about this particular talk. You know, the, the, the book. I mean, um, you know, this. It was obvious with the uh, labor core working people. You know, the the task merging. There was a merging of cash which took place in uh, in the front. Did it, I mean, I don't know whether you've gone into that, did it in, in any way substantially affect the caste structure in India? I mean, it, it, it sort of, did it reflect uh, in some way in the, in the merging of uh, caste distinction uh, within India? Um. That's a very interesting and complex question, and I'm glad you raised it because, you know, sometimes when this caste issue is raised, you have to walk on eggshells, and this is where one gets trolled, if one even raises it, it at all. Now, I would say that, you know, caste was something which uh, in the Indian army was co-constituted in the sense, for example, this whole idea of martial castes was co-constructed between the army authorities when they were shifting recruitment away from Madras and Western India towards Northern India by the end of the 20th century. Suddenly the Madras army, which had helped it to conquer Burma and, and Jakarta, you know, had been sort of circulating all around the Indian Ocean. Suddenly, because the Madras army had a large number of lower castes, it was not regarded as the proper kind of material to fight Afghan, the Afghan-Russian threat on the Northwestern frontier. And obviously, uh, you know, communities in Northern India, as well as across the frontier in Nepal, 
they were keen to make the army part of their livelihood strategies. So in a sense, the martial caste, as Devi, uh, this martial caste idea, as David Omissi points out, is co-constituted as between, you know, European military officers, as well as the peasant communities in Northern India, who were keen to put, them for, put themselves forward as ideal soldier material. Now, when we come to other groups, for example, you will find that uh, from the late 19th century with bacteriology and parasitology, unfortunately, the conservancy workers who could be got, of course, only from the so-called Dalit castes, sanitary ideas overlapped with caste ideas to kind of make sort of uh, pollution overlap with ideas about germ infestation. But on the other hand, what we find is that even conservant, in a sense also, conservancy workers were needed very badly. So you had the 1911 Indian Army Act in which they were being told now that those who were attested and enrolled, they would have to march with the army wherever they went. Now, their argument was then that if we have to march with the army wherever you go, we should be integrated more into the structure of the army and receive service and pensionary benefits. So what you have is both on the one hand, uh, you know, history is very complex. There are no easy trajectories. So on the one hand, you have, in a sense, as I said, the overlapping of ideas about pollution with ideas about bacteriology and bodies and clothing and work, which seems to be infested with pathogenic germs. But on the other hand, this becomes a very vital service. So you have to give them greater benefits. Now in recruiting in Madras presidency, I did come across uh, 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 an economist, Gilbert Slater, he was an economist attached, I think, to Madras University Economics Department. And he said that recruiters in Madras presidency were going around telling Dalit communities that join the army. When you come back, you will be able to walk with pride into Brahmin residential localities. Nobody will be able to stop you. On the other hand, in northern India, I found a recruiting poster which said, oh, Brahmins, and Rajputs, if you don't join the army, you might find that a Parsi Subedar has come home and you might find yourself having to salute him. So recruitment propaganda was using both aspiration in Madras presidency to recruit from Dalit communities and it was looking to fear, fear of being overtaken in Northern India to recruit from high caste communities. So this play of caste in recruitment and in World War I is a very interesting uh, story. I have a feeling that following David Omissi's suggestion, we have to look at caste as it was emerging in Indian army uh, circles as co-constitutive, something which was being put together, not just from above, but, you know, uh, from uh, also, in a sense, from, uh, from within the ranks of Indian combatants and non-combatants. Did, uh, did, uh, did uh, recruitment in World War I improve the position of uh, Dalits? Well, you know, uh, in World War I, recruitment expanded. Groups which had, to whom recruitment had closed, the doors opened again. But after about 1921, with demobilization and retrenchment, the low caste recruitment was shut down again. However, in 1917, uh, as a result of the intensification of war in India, uh, what you had was that the British government had to promise constitutional reforms. This was the context in which Montague, the Secretary of State came to India, and in a sense, in 1917, the promise of constitutional reforms dynamized political life in India. All kinds of communities, tribal communities, Dalit communities, they began to set up associations. 
And if anyone wants to read about the effect which this moment in 1917 had on Dalit public spheres, you have to read a wonderful essay by Ambedkar called A Strange Event, which he wrote in 1970. I can see uh, another hand. Yeah. Any, any more questions? Uh, yes, ma'am, if I may. Yeah, Ashi, please. Hi, uh, ma'am, I, uh, I was, uh, the question's already been asked about uh, caste. I was thinking a little bit about gender. Uh, I attended a very uh, interesting presentation recently by Urve Khaitan about the women of the Indian Labour Co. Uh, in East India. Something like 30,000 women were mobilized for aerodrome construction and things like that. So I'm just wondering, uh, were women mobilized either within India or, or, or potentially overseas? Why were, why were Indian women, for instance, not, not sent overseas, given that we have uh, you know, the example of indentured labourers being sent to places like Fiji and so on? So the first thing is that it was precisely because women went with indentured laborers that the moral argument could be used against indenture. They said Indian men were made into coolies and the women were made into prostitutes. And that was a charge which the British government found very hard to defend itself against. So indenture was compromised not only because they went under criminal breach of contract, but because it was said that Indian uh, uh, coolie women were exploited sexually. Now, that is a complicated story, and I'm not sure that you know, we can't take it for granted that this was the case, but certainly it was precisely the presence of Indian women in indentured migration, which was a source of embarrassment for the government of India. Now, for that reason, therefore, there was all the more reason then to cast labor recruitment as a military enterprise, to cast a military cloak over it and to point out that it's an all-male migration. Now, the problem with that was that very many of construction laborers, etc., in India worked as family units. So that kind of contributed to the problems of recruiting labor, because as Ian Kerr has shown, you know, Indian women headloaders and all that were very important for railway construction. Now, in terms of the use of women labor by the army within India, in the region from say Darjeeling eastwards to uh, Sikkim and on to uh, eastwards to Northeast India, you had women porters along with male porters who were part of the coolie, uh, coolie corps, which the coolies whom the army or the uh, Assam military police used to draw upon for its frontier military expeditions. For example, when young husband took his expedition to Burma in 1902, there were 600 Sikkimese women coolies in the forces. Again, during the Abor War of 1911, or um, Abor, who are now known as Adis, you had uh, 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 female Adi porters in the expeditionary force. Now, what we have to remember is that if we look at India's material contribution to the war, then we get a sense of how important female <coughs> and child labor was to India's war effort. You would not have been able to recruit so much from Haryana and Punjab if you could not count on women who were used to working in the fields, women and children who were used to working in the fields to step in. You could, you, the jute factories, there was a sizable female presence in the jute factories, which were thriving in World War I. There was a sizable presence in, of women in the textile industries. The rubber plantations in South India, you had women tappers, okay? And you had also, you talked about Urbi's, uh, Urbi's Khaitan's wonderful work on how women uh, were used, you know, both for aerodrome construction and also women were now allowed in World War II to enter even the underground work in coal mines in India in World War II. Now, of course, women were also there in the badly paid and very precarious overground work in coal mines in India also. And coal, of course, was very important for World War I. Companies, uh, industrial companies had to stay on the right side of the government of India and contribute to the war loans because they had to have privileged access both to fuel as well as to railway transport. 
And when we look at pictures of dock workers, for example, in Calcutta, we can see regularly a line of women who are climbing the gang plank to enter, uh, to sort of uh, fill in the uh, stock, uh, to stock ships, uh, I think. So if we look at the material contribution of India to the war, then the presence of Indian women will come into the picture. But Indian middle-class women, were also being encouraged to come into sort of war work and welfare work. For example, Jawaharlal Nehru remembers his mother knitting, you know, knitting things uh, for the Indian soldiers. And you know that Gandhi's wife and, you know, women in England were organizing packages, relief packages. They were encouraging people to subscribe to the war loan. And there was a very formidable figure whom uh, people in Chennai will be familiar with that is Lady Willingdon. Now she was a very formidable figure who did a lot to mobilize, uh, mobilize the sort of charity and support effort for hospitals and uh, you know, uh, gift packages, et cetera, in Bombay. And she was so persistent and she of course helped to set up uh, the Queen Mary's uh, school in Pune for disabled uh, soldiers. And after their tenure in Bombay, Lady Willingdon came to Madras, uh, where you know, she was important in setting up uh, maternity schemes and things like that. She was a very formidable person, and she was so persistent when she wanted anything. Apparently, her ADC used to accompany with her, her with a large handbag, and if she liked something, she had to have it. Uh, and apparently, when she went to visit the Nawab of uh, the Raja of Baroda, they hurriedly buried their jewels in, such, in, in case she started asking for them, you know, whether for the war loan or whatever. Uh, so, uh, yes, you did have. And Indian women were reading very, with great interest, to reports about the diversity of jobs which British and other European women were taking up in India in World War I. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ma'am, can uh, one more question by any uh, chance? Yeah. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Uh, I had a question. I work with uh, water communities who live in the shifting islands of maybe, the world. Maybe know your name, please. Please introduce uh, yourself. My and your name research. is Nadifa. Uh, I am a social geographer who has been uh, pursuing my PhD from JNU and uh, my question was, I work on these uh, East Bengali immigrants who, who were brought in by the British during the same time that you were talking about during World War One, when the railways were, railway lines were laid out for the first time. And there was a certain sort of profiling that was going on where initially the Nagas were seen as people who will be able to uh, clear up the jungles in the very fertile islands of Brahmaputra so that the uh, cultivation, the agricultural production for the empire can go up and they can benefit from it. And eventually the Gorkhas and the Adivasis were brought in from different parts of the um, country. But eventually, like it is beginning to make a lot of sense when you're talking about deployment of these people from the coastal areas, especially in the frontier areas, where initially they were seen as coolies, but eventually as martial races, and they were deployed to French Guiana and Fiji and all these other places. So uh, my uh, question was, when there is this profiling going on, where people in the frontier regions of the Indian subcontinent were usually being seen as uh, martial races or at least uh, mobile labor to be put in various parts of the British Empire so that their barracks could be held up. Why is it that the East Bengalis in that area could, were not seen as uh, martial races but only as agricultural laborers and they still uh, maintain, like, even in this post-colonial setup, they are still being seen as only agricultural races. So I was generally wondering what is the psychology behind it in terms of uh, the post-colonial uh, India that we are a part of. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I really, I mean, that's a fascinating project you have, and I can't say much about it. But Labor, East Bengali labor, labor from Chittagong, it's certainly made up a part of the Bengal labor core. 
which was raised. It was uh, sort of about 500 men. And within the so-called Bengal Labor Corps were in fact migrants. That is, you had Santali laborers as well as people from Chittagong who might have gone as Laskars earlier. But in World War I, going in the Labor Corps was a safer option because you were less likely to encounter a submarine at sea or to be drowned. In fact, you did have very many Laskars who were drowned at sea, many of them from Chittagong. And that is why in World War I, now Laskars got the torpedo medal and a memorial was set up in Calcutta. There's, there's a war memorial for Laskars in Calcutta. Now, Chittagong laborers were also used in road building along the frontier in Northeast India. So along the roads in Northeastern India, you would have had Pathan labor, you would have had Gurkhali labor, you would have had Chittagonian labor, and you would have had local so-called, these are all words I have to use in inverted commas because they were used at that time, you would have so-called primitive hillmen labor, that is Khasis, Nagas, etc. Now, what I found was, for example, that in the Khasi Labor Corps, you actually had a large number of people from East Bengal. Okay, you had. Now, the point is that um, because of the interest taken by people in the Northeast in the Labor Corps, which was sent to France, um, one of the participants in this program spoke about this you actually have the writing of very mono-ethnic accounts. That is, you might think there are only Khasis in the labor corps, but they weren't. I mean, there was the, the, the people who had been migrating into Northeastern uh, India, into the hill districts of Northeast India, they, were, they, they also had a presence in this labor corps. But their story is left out of the picture and given the current investment in you know, in, in this, uh, the fact that they were on the world stage, there's nobody yet speaking up for these other elements in the Khasi labor call, like the Gurkhalis and the people from Chittagong, etc. So that's an interesting question that you asked. So far as the, uh, why they are, uh, yes. Now, so far as the sort of, as the people from the Naga Hill districts so or the Khasis, the, uh, the sort of uh, Tankul Nagas from Manipur and all were concerned, the British always tended to represent them as warriors rather than, or, you know, uh, head, head hunting tribes or as warriors rather than as <coughs> martial castes. In other words, they kept their image as deliberately archaic, even though these so-called coolies had been very important to British conquests in Northeastern India. For example, the cookies of Manipur had been used by the British as both as coolies and as scouts and as auxiliaries in all their kind of, uh, you know, during the Lashai campaign, etc. Uh, you know, they had been used not only as coolies, but also as, uh, uh, com uh, as combatants, but they were given the deliberately archaic word uh, label of warriors because people like Hutton or J in, Na in the Naga Hills district or JP Mills, they always wanted to give the impression that uh, the empire was in fact tapping the natural uh, cultural warrior-like qualities of these tribes and preserving them for them. Now the missionaries had a different idea about what they wanted and the uh, people, the administrative ethnographers had a different idea. So we mustn't assume that they all had the same idea about what they wanted to do in this area. But thank you for your question. And I would like to hear more about your project, of course. Thank you, thank you for the lovely answer. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, Captain Anand here. Just yeah, one Anand, question. go ahead, please. Good evening, ma'am. Anand here. Uh, I am a banker by profession. I uh, handle finance operations to work out of Chennai. So, I mean, first of all, a very interesting talk. And then I've never seen this side of the war. As you yourself said, you know, we look at the combatants mostly. So my question is more from uh, the aspect of jail recruitments that you mentioned as a source of laborers now during the war. Is there any link analysis or connection that showed that uh, jails eventually became a hiring ground so there are some increasing trend in crime rates at that time, or people who were hired from jails tended to think 
that they are still in shackles and they get their food within the cell, but now they are out and they open a sort of psychological freedom, though they are probably made to work harder, and still they get food and rations free. And where these who returned back to India after the war, those who survived, were pardoned or sentences reduced? It's kind of two questions, but it's just curious to know on this. Uh, very interesting. You know, the participants in the seminar are allowing me to kind of expand upon my work, which is uh, very nice. And it shows a very perceptive engagement with the material under discussion. So when they were recruiting from jail, they cast it as an experiment in penological reform. That is, they said that it was a chance for laborers to make good, that they would be trained for freedom. They would learn to work. They would be trained for freedom. And uh, this was part of what we call uh, of a worldwide movement to shift from a retributive uh, mode of punishment to one which was called a progressive, which was called progressive stage punishment. That is, you encouraged, you created under confinement conditions which would gradually uh, resemble those of free life, so that you were training them for freedom. Now, the retributive impulse has never gone as we can see from the kind of strong support which people in India still give to the death penalty. So, uh, but anyway, this was the kind of uh, propaganda with which laborers were recruited from jail. And those who were recruited initially were told that if you serve for two years in Mesopotamia, you will have a remission of the rest of your sentence. Wow. Now, even for jail labor, this had to be presented as a voluntary exercise. Now, why somebody would want to go to clean latrines in Mesopotamia, we don't know how voluntary it was. And it's very suspicious that the Punjab government in particular supplied a large number of latrine cleaners for Mesopotamia because the Punjab government was basically the, you know, the recruiting sergeant uh, for the empire in World War I. But the laborers, I mean, there was a formal kind of rich uh, ceremony almost where they were asked to come up and sign. And laborers, jail labor interpreted to mean that they were now in possession of their labor again. So they had to be disabused of that. So right at the beginning, there was this idea that we have contracted. You didn't say that we have to go anyway. You asked us if you wanted to volunteer, and by asking us, you are acknowledging that we are now free. So that was a point of tension. Secondly, jail laborers also embraced the military cloak because that military cloak allowed them to present themselves as uh, military personnel rather than as convicts. So they had some uh, clashes, in fact, with other personnel when they were called Kaidis or something in Mesopotamia, you did have conflicts between those laborers and that. And particularly those who were convict recruited warders, they began to wear a pagri and to, they were called, they, they were termed, uh, they were termed dafadars. And they began to regard themselves as havildars, sorry, they were termed daf, uh, havildars. And they played a very important role in organizing and supervising labor on railways, etc. In addition, you see, if you had jail labor, which was concentrated on a site like Basra, then you could have very strict controls over them. But if they were scattered along the length of a railway track, you really needed these jail recruited havildars to kind of ensure that labor didn't flee. And in a sense, you can see that labor was kind of, uh, jail labor was kind of merging into free labor. But on the other hand, there was a tendency also to start treating free labor almost as though you could treat them at, as harshly as jail labor. So it went both ways. Jail labor started to feel more free. But on the other hand, you started to uh, kind of assume that you could put the same coercive controls on free labor as well. And this led to clashes. Now, what is very interesting is that the Bombay Jail Labor Corps had been recruited for two years, and those two years came to an end in uh, October 1918. So they said, you know, our, our uh, term of labor is at an end, now send us home. They said, no, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, they started saying, no, you were recruited on this date, not on this date. Then the others who had been recruit recruited for duration of the war started telling them that we have been recruited for the duration of the war. The armistice has been signed. The war is at an end. Send us home. And they were told, no, the armistice doesn't mean that the war is at an end. It just means a temporary cessation. Mm 
So already by 1918, you can see that both from jail labor and free labor, a potential labor problem could be building up, was building up in Mesopotamia about the duration of war contracts. Now, what happened was that labor in the jail labor, uh, once, uh, you know, uh, British forces were withdrawn, the Australian soldiers were withdrawn, etc. The high levels of violence needed to keep something like the jail labor corps in place were no longer possible. So something which had been started off and propagandized as an experiment in penal reform, which would place India on a level with penological reform globally. And the gentleman, uh, W.B. Lane, who was an inspector general of prisons and hoped that the jail labor corps would become a permanent experiment, something on the lines of the foreign legion. Uh, in France, he was told, no, no, uh, this is too problematic. It's leading to criticism in India. And <clears throat> subsequently, this whole experiment was cast as a temporary measure just to meet a bottle in labor supply. You know, the, all the talk about it being an experiment in penal reform was kind of set aside. Now, what is interesting is that as uh, <clears throat> this labor began to came, come back, it started, it was trickling back to India, say, in 1919. Now, 1918 to 1919 were horrible years for India. What you had was the effect of the influenza epidemic. You had cruelly high prices. And obviously, you had unrest. In Madras, for example, you had famine rats in 1918. Now, what began to happen was that this, it was very convenient to blame this unrest on the return of the uh, jail laborers from Mesopotamia, though there is absolutely no evidence to show that the people who were caught for, you know, uh, for this high crime rates in, in the close of 1918 and 19 were from the jail labor corps, but it provided a convenient excuse for it. So I think uh, that is, did I leave out anything which That's you asked? Not because yes, yes, no, no, thank you so much. Very detailed. It's a completely different chapter altogether. Thank you thank very you, much, uh, Professor Singha. So, if you all, um, uh, we'll pause for a couple of minutes. I mean, we'll just play the national anthem on the end of the program. Uh, Ram, my, my this thing is hung. Uh, can you play that? I will, sir. I will, sir. Yeah, please. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. And uh, Good night, sir. Good night. Good Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry if Tom, I think my last answer was too long. I hope you didn't. Uh, no problem. Uh, no, 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 no. Very, very, very useful. Thank you so much for your look, look, for, look forward to seeing you all here on 12. We have got a very interesting talk on the Indian Air Force, its origins. Yes, nice I must introduce here. my uh, former student, Ashik, to this forum. He has worked on uh, his, his PhD topic. is a very unique one, and I'm sure you'll enjoy his talk on uh, the Indian Air Force. He's an Oxford scholar, in fact. We'll, uh, yes, yes. After JNU, he went to Oxford, yes. Yes. So, um, we, you'll all be receiving in the normal course, you know, this is like next fortnightly program. Actually, I put in for 26, then, you know, the, the gentleman on 12th. So, when, when, uh, so now, it's, now it's on the 12th. Is it 12th of March? 12th, yeah. yeah. I've advanced his date because okay. the one in between uh, fell sick. So, I'll count on Ashik to remind me. <laughs> yeah. I love, we, we'll, you'll get the intuition. Okay.
Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. And, uh, you know, the audience was an uh, sort of ideal audience because they asked all the right questions. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I really I enjoyed think. it. So, of course, I, I, I promised the whole thing to be wound up in one hour, but I think it will be made you speak almost an hour and a half. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, it's uh, because of so many questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye, Ashik. Bye.